Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming to this uh, public art bootcamp session, everyone. Uh, appreciate all of y'all who stuck around while we sort of were setting up because we didn't set up a waiting room. So thank you for awkwardly just staring at us kind of sitting here for the past like five minutes, um, especially at Karina, you got here a little early. So appreciate you hanging in there. Um, but yeah, this is one of quite a few public art bootcamp sessions that we'll be having um, that'll be open to the public. And this first session will be centered on where to begin um, developing concepts for public art. And yeah, I'll sort of take you through what we'll be presenting this evening as well as over the next few months, and then we'll hop right into artist presentations. Cool. Well, thanks again. Um, and yeah, so just a little introduction before we hop into things. Um, so my name is Ricky. I am a public art project manager with the Office of Arts and Culture. Um, I'm also joined by two other project managers, Maya and Jeremy, who co-manage the public art bootcamp project. Um, and yeah, just to root us tonight, I wanted to read our commitment to racial equity. So the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture commits to an anti-racist work practice that centers the creativity and leadership of people of color, those most impacted by structural racism, to move towards systems that benefit fit us all. We also acknowledge that we're on indigenous land, the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. Yeah, so just to give you a little idea of what's coming up. So um, on Thursday, March 9th, we'll have a session open to the public on hiring subcontractors. So um, we'll be able to talk with engineers, uh, fabricators, and artwork installers. Um, on Thursday, May 11th, uh, we'll have a session on life after project completion. So we'll go over all of the nitty gritty with lawyers and um, with other artists who have put up artworks and sort of wonder, well, what happens after I've installed and what rights do I have when things happen and when I deinstall and while the artwork is still up. Um, and then keep an eye out in fall 2023, we'll have all of the current public art boot campers uh, artworks installed both within Seattle Center and throughout Beacon Hill. Um, and just the last thing that I'll mention too before we hop into things. So uh, we do have a growing library of previously recorded sessions from these other boot camps. Um, and we're hoping that this will be a part of that too, so that for anyone who's curious around what it looks like to get into the field of public art, um, they can access it um, and it'll be publicly available and open source for folks to use far into the future. Um, so that'll be updated on our YouTube within the next month or so after this, and then uh, the link will be sent out to everyone. All right, great. Um, yeah, so without further ado, um, the three speakers that you'll be hearing from tonight are Aaron Shigaki. Um, we'll be talking with Damon Brown and then Horatio Law. Um, they all have a really wide breadth and range of experiences, ranging from temporary artworks to um, permanent artworks and everything in between and experience both within and outside of public art. Um, so yeah, really excited to hear from them. And without further ado, I will toss it over to Aaron for their presentation. Thank you. Hello, great WebEx room of people that I can't see. Um, Great to be here in powerful company. At least I know two of my colleagues, um, Horatio and Damon. Um, I lived on the East Coast in Brooklyn for a long time, and I worked as a graphic designer and an art art educator, art educator there. Excuse me, <clears throat> before moving back home to Seattle. And um, you know, honestly, in the hustle that is. New York City life, I never once thought about expanding into a fuller art career. And um, somewhat embarrassingly, the depth of my understanding of public art was mainly limited to big sculptures and epic murals by men like Rivera and Noguchi and Calder and more. Um, but I am proud to say that I am part of the 2018 public art boot camp class. And it really honestly did change the course of my career. Um, beside the practical information, there were inspirational talks from local public artists at all stages of careers, which was really meaningful to me. 
And also, um, I was really impacted by knowing that the city of Seattle was making space for social practice artists. Um, okay, let's go to the, the next slide. In asking myself what's important, what do I want to say in my art, what do I think is missing from the conversation, I decided that I wanted to make public art about the community that I'm most intimately connected with, the Japanese American one. Next, please. This story for me is rooted in a twice stolen place, the Duwamish land of Nihonmachi or Japantown, which is now a sliver of the Chinatown International District. Next, please. And it's a story importantly rooted in my community's unconstitutional World War II mass incarceration based on race. And in the duality of the extreme hardships before, during, and after the war. Next, please. And then also in the incredible resilience, resistance, and community care that took place in those prison camps so that future generations, so that I could have a decent life. And those are just a few of my precious family photos from that period. Um, telling these stories is very intertwined with my community building and activism work, which is helpful because even if the type of work is different, I'm always thinking about and expanding upon meanings and deriving inspiration from people, places, and events. I help run an annual pilgrimage to Minidoka. We can go to the next one, Jeremy, thanks. And that's the incarceration site in Southern Idaho where my family and um, most folks from the Seattle area were imprisoned. And let's go to the next one. And I work with a national group of Japanese Americans engaged in direct action abolition projects. Um, and in this particular region, we work a lot to close the Northwest Detention Center, which is down in Tacoma. Uh, next one. And I also serve on the board of a really amazing television show called Look, Listen, and Learn, which is a Black women-led early learning program for children of color that celebrates radical Black joy. And actually, Damon Brown has done some art guest spots, and hopefully Ricky's going to be doing some, too, in the next season. Next, please. And so, over time, even if it wasn't perfectly clear to me at the start, I've distilled my guiding purpose to this. My North Star is to tell the Japanese American story in memory of my ancestors and in service of the liberation of all people. All right, next. So I'm going to talk about one of my very first projects that happened in the same year that I was in the boot camp program. Um, and I'm really glad to kind of go back and reflect on it because it, it taught me a lot. And I began conceptualizing Sending Body Shrine during the boot camp. Um, and it was for an arts call for temporary projects in the Rainier Beach neighborhood of Seattle which was only open to um, past and current boot campers, which was a quite a nice setup. Next, please. I think a lot about reclamation of culture and how that's connected to the incarceration that I briefly mentioned, um, as well as to assimilation and the pressures of white supremacy in this country. So these are Shinto temple tablets or Emma that you see all over Japan at Shinto Shrines. And I've always been really intrigued by their simple and beautiful form and the variety in design and the participatory act um, that, that people use with them. So you purchase one of these Emma from the shrine shop and then you wish, write your wish on it in handwriting um, and leave it behind for the gods and the spirits. Next, please. Another old Shinto custom that um, hit me very emotionally is sending body itself, which is in the title of my piece. And its meaning is 1000 person stitches. 
and it's a practice that women organized to have 1000 different hands sew 1000 red French knot stitches onto garments as amulets for their sons and husbands departing for war. And I just, I love that infusion of spirit, you know, of these 1000 different people going off in these garments. And this is a, just a postcard that I found on, on eBay when I kind of went down this rabbit hole, looking up, you know, trying to research the concept. Let's go to the next one. And then this is one of the garments, but this one was, was sewn by a thousand different hands in an American concentration camp. So this practice was happening, you know, on both sides of the ocean, which I also find um, very moving. And so then my question was, how do I take a very small intimate practice and expand it into a still intimate, but public art scaled piece? And I chose to use red knotted rope to represent the small stitches. And I thought about the other symbolic meanings um, that that red rope could take, such as bloodlines of connection and the way that we're all inextricably knotted together of this place, no matter our origins. Next, please. Um, so actually, I was not chosen for that first thing I applied for, even though I was so excited and so sure I would be, um, but that was okay because I kept on thinking about the concept and doing other pieces around it because I really, I really believed in it. Um, so here's a, just a little painting I did on some um, recycled fish cake boards. And the next one, please. And then I took this bronze casting class at Pratt and I, so I was kind of playing around with another iteration of it. Next one. And then I finally was chosen for a temporary activation um, in Occidental Park in Seattle through the Downtown Seattle Association, which, and hopefully that um, call is still going on. Um, and by this point, I had decided to collect the Emma, the plaques, in a, in a very particular way. Instead of writing messages on them myself, I wanted to secure opportunities to present this idea as an activity for community members. Next, please. Oh, sorry, this is a little bit out of order, but I just want I found my little budget form um, for this project. And I think I had just received this, like, I don't know, from something I applied for, they had this ready to go budget form that did all the math for you. And I, it's, it's been such a helpful tool. I just, I use it for every project and especially for temporary projects um, where the funding is so tight. It, I feel like it's super helpful to really watch your pennies. Uh, let's go to the next one. All right. So I decided to do some community activations. This one is in Nihonmachi or Japantown in Chio's garden. Um, next, please. And, you know, people really enjoyed it because anyone, any age could do it. The instruction was simple. Um, please write your hope or positive hope or wish for the future. I think that was really my only instruction and um, folks were just so excited to be part of a public art project next please so here's some of the the bounty that i collected for my installation next one please and a couple of installation shots shout out there to seth geyser who is my project manager and uh, to my uncle, Eugene Tagawa, who takes all of my pictures. Uh, let's go to the next one. And, you know, just a, just a note, like every project that you're going to do will have some timing issues. Just uh, seems like it's often a hurry up and wait situation in public art. Um, in this case, we waited a really long time to kind of figure out with the arborists what was safe to do for the trees, which I totally understand. 
Next, please. Um, and another thing I remember having to really think carefully through, which I had absolutely no experience with, was how to securely fasten these very heavy ropes um, onto trees in a fashion um, that would, you know, stay in crazy Seattle weather for, it was supposed to be three months, but it ended up staying up for over a year. So that was an interesting aspect. Um, next, please. And then just, I just, I like to just say that I keep on working with the concept until it, it kind of, you know, starts, it loses resonance. So here I'm working again with some bronze pieces and another advance, please. And then I kind of did a blown up version um, of the Emma idea using the same rope because it was such expensive material. So I was really happy that it lasted and I was really happy that I could um, use it again. Let me think I have one more here. Next, please. Yeah, I actually, um, the Downtown Seattle Association wanted me to put this piece up in two different locations. It never went up in the second location. So I had this whole other set of stuff that I then wound up getting to show um, in the Cornish Playhouse. Next, please. Um, I just want to say in conclusion that I've really helped found it helpful to find guides to help me create a body of work that has variety and makes sense together and that I believe in and stand behind. Next, please. For me, one of my mentors, even though I don't know him personally, and I just did an online class with him, um, is artist and former Black Panther designer Emery Douglas. Next, please. I just, I love that he has a manifesto, and I just, I love these two um, of many. Recognize that art is a powerful tool, a language that can be used to enlighten, inform, and guide to action. Create art that challenges the colonization of the imagination. Power to the people. Next, please. Um, and then I, I collect and think about other words that people in my community have written. And this is from an essay um, written by a brilliant Densho person named Nina Wallace. What kind of ancestors do we want to be? So that has kind of become one of my guiding questions as well. Um, next, please. And then I just return to my guiding statement again and again when I need to get back on track or refine an idea or a proposal. And next, please. And, um, that's about it. And I just want to say I intentionally added a lot of shout outs in my talk because I think that this work is really team oriented and the more relationships you build, the smoother your path will be. And I think that many of us in public art are really committed to the democratization of art and space. So I hope that you'll reach out and keep in touch and we'll also enjoy that part of the process. Thanks a lot. I'll see the boot campers in the next hour. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. That was really great. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to hear what questions folks may have at the end of this and hopefully dive a little bit deeper as well. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I'm not going to take up too much time. Uh, but yeah, the next speaker is going to be Damon Brown, um, also known as Creative Lou. So yeah, please join me in welcoming Damon to, to the stage. Hello. Uh, welcome all that I also can't see. Um, again, my name is Damon Brown and I go by Creative Lou and we can start. Next slide. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, the concept that I developed and piece that I developed for um, Uncle Bob's Place, a new project that is currently, I think, almost complete done that's in the ID. So next slide. 
Um, I am a happy graduate of boot camp class, I think 2019, <laughs> where I met Aaron as I went along this journey and we, we become friends as well through this. Um, when I was young, I was pretty much a kid that grew up watching cartoons, looking at cereal boxes, wanted to animate for Disney, wanted to animate for uh, Marvel. And then I think I went to graffiti before eventually going on to school to learn art. Um, when I came out, um, I was definitely a classical 2D artist, illustrator, and all those things. But over time, I realized that ultimately I was really a creative problem solver, um, or I like to communicate visually. Um, so uh, next, oh, well, before I go to the next slide. So when the boot camp um, came up, I was like, let me let me go into this. I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know um, what was entail. Um, I also thought it was big sculptures, um, things that I had never touched. I knew people that I went to art school with that did these things, but it wasn't necessarily the practice that I was particularly practicing at the time. So I didn't know how my art would, would transfer over. Um, my project coordinator through the boot camp was Maya, who was wonderful and helped me along through this whole process. Um, so I was able to learn how I could transfer my 2D skills to 3D or public art. Next slide. So for this project, um, I was selected to create um, a balcony. There was eight, there's, I believe, eight or 12 balconies on this new building that they're creating for Uncle Bob. And Uncle Bob was a, um, a basically an activist for Seattle that worked to preserve Seattle's Chinatown and international districts in the 1960s. But along with that, he teamed up with um, four other, three other activists, um, Roberto, Bernie, and Larry Gossett, and they called themselves the Gang of Four. Um, and they were committed to connecting their various communities and the need for relationships between cultural communities to be nurtured, strengthened, not just during their time, but also the future. Um, so I was one of the artists that was selected to create one of these balconies. And I've done other public art activations where you engage the community and you ask questions to see what the community wants in their, um, for their public art. I've been with others where this has already been decided. This particular one, there was a list of um, categories that you could choose from or put your name in that you wanted to represent. I put my name in the hat to do cross community um, relationship building. And I received that was going to be my subject matter for my piece. Next slide. Um, the parameters of this, this piece was it was going to be metal fabricated in metal, laser cut. It was also going to be a balcony. So there was parameters on um, certain areas could not have openings that maybe a hand could get stuck in. You couldn't have any jagged edges. Um, there was bars behind it that wrapped the balcony that you wouldn't be able to see through. So there was all these technical parameters and guidelines and learning of the material that I needed to get my wrap my mind around before proceeding through with what I was going to create. I knew that I didn't want to take my classical style of illustration and just do like a 2D line art. I wanted to do something else that was going to challenge me creatively uh, as I moved in my career. Um, next slide. Um, so usually when I con concept a work, I kind of do a deep dive and a history on what I'm going to tell. So not only was I going to tell the cross communications of what the, the gang of four did, um, I wanted to take in consideration what was there before this building went up, which was Bush Garden. I wanted to take in consideration the characters, the Asian characters, some of the patterns of classic uh, Mexican clothing, Native American clothing, and all these things. So as I take all these different creative brainstorms and how I'm gonna tell my story, I began to sketch these things out. Next slide. So I began to look up um, what the characters for equality work. And I took those characters and I was like, I'm going to create something artistic out of those, as you see um, at the bottom, bottom left. And then I began to think of all of the clothing and the different patterns that make up the, 
the other cultures, the Hispanic, Native American, and Mexican, and what those will look like, and begin to start filling in those shapes with those patterns to show this cross connection or this collaboration. And the icon at the bottom was going to be uh, a human figure for the future, us, to keep this idea going on. Um, so as you go to the next slide, and I should say this came back several times because some of the figures were jagged, some of the holes were too big, so I had to make sure everything fit. So ultimately I was able to take all of the information, put it into the characters I de designed, bring in all the patterns from the different cultures for this cross connection, and then make this beautiful mosaic kind of symbolistic um, banister that you see. And then on each on the sides of the people that represent us to keep this message going forward. And that was it, basically. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, I'll talk to the boot campers after this as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Damon. We really appreciate it. Um, and at this point, so Horatio will be our last speaker. And our hope is really that we can spend the last bit of time answering questions from the audience. So I'd say if there's anything from Aaron's presentation or Damon's presentation that's standing out that you're curious about um, or anything in Horatio's presentation that may be brought up that you're curious about, definitely start thinking about those questions and feel free to add them to the chat. Uh, and we will try to get to them after Horatio's presentation. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I will move you to the stage and please help me welcome Horatio Law. Hello, everyone. Uh, is my sound okay? I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, first slide, please. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about one particular project, and uh, this is the latest project that I've done. Um, the, um, it's advancing by itself. Is it possible to hold it back? <laughs> well, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So the, this project is called the ACE Memorial Pathway, and it's a um, project that is commemorate um, people who are affected by the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic including people who have died from it and also people who suffer and survive and people who still continue to be affected by HIV um, uh, and, and AIDS. And um, are you getting back there? Hold on. Um, another part of it is um, we also want to honor the people who were instrumental in helping um, during the AIDS crisis. So it's a very, very diverse and very deep project. And it's one of my biggest projects and uh, I have ever done. Uh, like all of you, I started out with a small project from uh, less than $50,000 project and I worked my way up. And uh, this particular project is part of a $2 million uh, project that were fundraised by, first by private um, individuals who band together, uh, realizing that we need some kind of memorial for the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, and then eventually the city and the county also uh, put in money to make it happen. Uh, so this project totally is about $2 million or a little bit more. It involved four three uh, public outdoor sculpture, one indoor uh, piece, and a cyber uh, component. Um, I was selected to first write the art plan for the ACE Memorial Pathway. Um, so let's see. Okay. The memorial pathway is um, a little bit lost because I made the uh, fifth slide. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, 
the memorial pathway didn't have a home before. So um, the individuals, the committee was waiting for an opportunity to um, find a space that would work. Uh, the city did not um, have a plan for a actual memorial for uh, a memorial. So uh, we kind of have to pull together different uh, public and private sector to create this memorial pathway. Um, so the opportunity came up when uh, Sound Transit decided to build a uh, light rail station at Capitol Hill. And that created not only the um, station, but it's also adjacent two block uh, property that have been uh, excavated for building the light rail, but also now available for uh, private development. Uh, the committee was able to come to, went to the developer and asked them if we can use some of the public space uh, for our memorial pathway and also uh, indoor space as well. They were also able to negotiate with uh, the parks department to use part of uh, Cal Anderson Park. So the slide you see in front of you um, involved the, all the project in the ACE Memorial Pathway of different uh, art zone. The one zone we I will be talking about is the purple one on the left side in the park. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of talking, showing you a lot of slides. Uh, so it'd be going really quickly. So the first thing I did was to study uh, the art zone and also see how people will walk around this. This will provide an um, overview of how this place is going to be used. Next slide, please. So the project I'm working, I worked on is called Cal Anderson Park Project. Um, from the art plan, um, the objective is to create a place for public contemplation, reflection, and remembrance for those who are affected by HIV AIDS. And the idea for exploration is also laid out for me uh, is talk about some of these ideas like um, healing in memory, uh, healing and remembering the presence of absence, holding on and letting go. Next. Uh, these are some of the material that I have collected and look at and the AIDS crisis have lasted and is still going on this 40 years now. Uh, from the beginning when people were dying mysteriously to the community of Seattle um, come together and just taking care of each other to the city finally uh, uh, so sort of looking to the problem and with the health department jumping in to help with the crisis. So it has a long history and literally very difficult to find a place to start. Next, please. So what I want to do is just want to show you some of my previous project before I jump right into it. Uh, the three projects I want to show you, just a brief photograph. First one is a guildable column. Next slide. Uh, this is one of my favorite and one of my oldest projects is in Seattle. Uh, it's the Asian Counseling and Referral Service. I was asked to design something to hang in the stairwell that representing all the diverse community within the organization and the people they were serving. So uh, I created this piece with these uh, ceramic rice bowl and uh, the rice bowl were all decorated on the outside by individuals that are connected with the organization. Uh, and, the out, and the inside is gilded gold. And so it's from the outside, you just see a gold column. But if you look in down uh, bottom in the side, you can see uh, all the decoration that people use. We're talking about their own history. Uh, a lot of them are immigrants. So they were be, uh, able to bring in uh, from the all different culture, decoration and design. Next slides. Uh, it's called South Park Vortex. Uh, it's in the South Park neighborhood in Seattle. And it's a, not a very, um, I say attractive site is uh, basically a drain drainage hole. 
and I was asked to create something that beautified the site and also uh, reflect the community itself. So uh, I thought about thinking about where the water come from and what, you know, and then go into the drainage. Uh, so most of Seattle's water come from um, uh, melted ice, so uh, melted snow. So I decided to work with the community to ask each of them, uh, you know, doing a workshop and ask to, asking the participant to come in and cut uh, paper cut snowflakes. As we know, everybody have their own way of cutting snowflakes. So every one of those designs are different. And then I use the design and sandblast it onto these uh, glass disc that has two layer. One layer is blue and the other layer is clear. And uh, when you sandblast away, certain part will be created blue and uh, uh, transparent aspect. Uh, next slides. Uh, the third project is called Fifth Wind. It's the Gateway Discovery Park in Portland. Uh, this, uh, the Gateway neighborhood had grew from a very um, uh, middle-class white American neighborhood into a multicultural neighborhood. So I was using the butterfly um, as a symbol for migration and the transformation of the caterpillar into a butterfly uh, through the cocoon. Um, this piece is made with stainless, uh, stainless steel with inlaid uh, glass, colored glass pieces. Next, please. So going back in uh, to uh, the ACE Memorial Project, uh, I have designed two community engagement tool. Uh, one is called the Yellow Brick Project. Uh, the, the idea is to community, connect with the community, paving the way for the ACE Memorial Pathway Project and uh, help the community remember, imagine using object as symbol for storytelling and then also use it for temporary installation. Next slide. When I think about the uh, LGBTQ community, which is affected by the AIDS crisis, I thought about the risk of us. Next. And of course, the yellow brick row. Next. So I thought about creating this brick uh, made of transparent paper. Next. And this is sort of like a, a template for a translucent sheet. Next. And when you fold the sheet together, you are able to uh, create this a brick with a tea candle inside. Next. And the second uh, community engagement tool is about star and constellation. Uh, the idea is to help individuals identify with the tribe. When you think about uh, star and constellation, a symbol, for community, and, um, and as we look at uh, individual who uh, in the his in history that people look to the sky, look at stars, with all the story and myth telling, and also um, star as a way of telling your own future. I want people to use this uh, project to talk about creating your own tribe and creating your own universe. Next. And also you can name your stars. And we talk about uh, using individual as the constellation and, and all the star that evolve around it. Next. Next. So it's a simple project. We're just using black cloth and plastic gemstone. And we do workshop and ask people to uh, uh, Try to remember the person that they want to commemorate and think about what represent that person uh, and then um, create a constellation based on that. Next. So um, with all that work, we actually wasn't able to do too many of this workshop because uh, there wasn't um, budget for it and also it wasn't time. It was on a very tight tight timeline. So I was able to do just a few um, community engagement on this one, although I did interview over 30 individuals and about 30 uh, organizations. So for this talk, if you, I would just want to emphasize that uh, what I want you to take away from is uh, what happened 
uh, during the proposal process, and also what happened when your proposal is rejected. So this is uh, my own experience. Uh, I first come up with a proposal called Aurora Sutra. Next. Uh, the objective is to illuminate the uh, LGBTQ uh, communal mourning and um, embody the ephemeral, the changing, shifting nature of grief, and also evokes a sense of aspiration for a spiritual path. Next. So the uh, direct inspiration is the Aurora Borealis, which is also called the Northern Light. Next. So the northern light is this very ev evasive and and uh, sort of uh, floating. Uh, it's sort of changing all the time. It's not solid, and so I, I thought it would be a very good uh, symbol for the sense of how we experience uh, grief. And um, next. Um, I was trying to find material that can create a sense of this uh, um, northern light idea of this floating light uh, curtain. And uh, I actually found this curtain at the uh, Office of Art and Culture uh, space. Uh, they have these uh, mesh, metal mesh uh, curtain um, that use a separate space. Uh, and I tried to light it with LED lights and see if we can create a sense of uh, glow and uh, invisibility and also uh, you know, how it flow and, and move. Next. Uh, this is a digital recreation. Uh, and I imagine an elevated mesh curtain uh, that is illuminated by LED light. So when the wind moves the curtain, you get this uh, wave and uh, the light would go in and out. And so it might recreate this sense of the northern light. Next. I imagine this uh, sneak through the pathway in the park and then eventually uh, become a circle in one portion of the park as well. Next. And I also imagine a sitting area with something in the center for people to sit and uh, look up and look at these floating curtains. Next. Uh, an alternate version because of budget issue, uh, instead of having the curtain sneaking through the park, I will have it uh, four curtain uh, forming a uh, circle and uh, as a different way to look at that. Next. So the proposal was rejected. Uh, part of the reason was that it was too evasive. It wasn't um the committee wanted something that that people can touch and feel um so i was sent back to uh rethink this uh, whole process um when i think about public art is you always have the possibility that your proposal will be rejected i have one project that uh i have to propose it three times so um but it's always that crush uh, of your ego, and um, and you have to sort of put it away, and then go back into work. So my second proposal is called Ribbon of Light, and when I'm showing you the next few slide, you can see how the idea that happened in the first proposal um, actually filter into the second proposal. Next. So in this second proposal, I imagine a side of the heaven fell from the sky and broke into large and small fragments, forming three groups of sculpture in Cal Anderson Park. Next. The inspiration are from words, images, uh, nature, natural and human artifacts. Next. Uh, two. Uh, inference uh, about written word that influenced me on this project is one by Michael Klein, who is the editor and contributor of a book of poetry uh, from different poets about the AIDS crisis. 
And he said in the book, uh, in the forward said, I'm still here, but differently. Looking at the whole fractured world, what that world has become with AIDS in it. Next. Another poet, Michelle Cliff, wrote, the morning you die, a piece of blue glass fell out of the sky. And when it is all over, we become, we become light. So that sort of formed the basis of my proposal uh, for the second proposal. Next. Uh, some of the things I look at are these ancient standing rocks. Uh, the purpose is still mysterious. Some think of they being a, a astronomical and also about telling time, season. Uh, but it's been around for a long time. Next. Uh, these are rock burial chamber. Um, and also probably around the same time these uh, those standing rocks were formed. Next. Uh, these layer rocks or sedimentary rocks formation, um, each layer of rocks sort of denote uh, passage of time and events. Um, so I imagine the ACE crisis is the latest of a series of uh, crisis that human faces, to human face, um, and each of these crises come and went. Some endure longer and some are shorter. Next. So I started sketching uh, based on uh, the visual that I show you. Uh, some of these pieces of uh, glass, I imagine, some are standing up, some are supporting each other, some are meandering around, uh, curvy. Next. I imagine these sculptures were, because my mandate is to have something people can relate to, can they can touch. I want something that is uh, slightly larger than human size, but no more than seven, eight foot tall. Uh, and because of the also um, limitation of material, uh, they are about 20 to 24 inches wide, and they could only be four inches thick, actually. Next. Next. Um, there's also opportunity to illuminate these pieces at night internally and externally. So um, I have to put that in the planning right from the beginning. Next. So this is one of my first sketch of two pieces of looking uh, laminated glass leaning against each other. That's the day view. Next. And that's the night view. Next. Materials are laminated or stacked uh, glass. They are half inch thickness, uh, frosted and sandblast, and also with engraved work inside. Next. 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 So you can uh, sandblast it to create frostiness and also texture. You can engrave work into the glass itself. You can also print between layer so that uh, it could be uh, look like it's emerged into something. Next. Because of the limitation lim uh, lamination, they have to stack on top of each other. It could not be thicker than four inches. Otherwise, the weight itself would squeeze out the lamination. Next. The free station, one is called monolith, one is called referee, and the, the third one is called lambda. Next. Next. So the monolith piece, the idea is that there's a, a grounding piece like a lightning, like a piece of glass that fell off the sky and just hit the earth. And also a way to, uh, call on people to remember and also mark the beginning of the pathway. Next. It's about seven foot tall, four inch thick. Next. Uh, the referee uh, consists of three 
curvy pieces and they're stacked glass instead of laminated glass. Uh, they, they encourage people to linger, to meander or passing through. They can touch and reflect and, uh, and process the feelings. Next. Next. Uh, lambda, the third, is a symbol for catalyst. Um, it shows that broken pieces, in this case, a uh, symbol for broken community, can still support each other. And the idea is to have this piece for people to gather, to rest, and to celebrate. Next. A lambda is from a Greek letter. It symbolizes catalyst for changes. It's also a Chinese word for enter, or you reverse it, it's a word for people. Next. So um, I mentioned before, uh, letters, uh, uh, words are engraved on the surface and also embedded inside these laminated pieces. For the monolith station, we call people, call on people to remember. So the words are moments, memories, and story. For the reverie station, uh, we ask people to illuminate uh, that experience of the ACE crisis. Uh, there are words like enrage, courage, engage, losing, releasing, forgiving, bereave, beloved, belong. And the last uh, station is the lambda piece. We have words like coping, sharing, healing, fighting, forging, and forward. And next slide. Is this the one? Yes. So you can see these uh, the engraved and also embedded words. Um, another feature of this sculpture is when it rained, the frostiness of the sculpture disappeared, and you can actually see everything through. So you can see the inside work very clearly. Uh, while other time depends on the time of the day and the lighting, you may may not be see all the words. Next. Uh, next, I gotta go pretty fast here because I'm running over time. And next, please. Uh, this is what they look like when they were built. And this is what they look like at night. And this is my last slide. Is a couple came over uh, during the uh, one of the celebration. And they were able to read the word on top of the sculptures and inside the sculpture, and they were very moved by it. Um, I think uh, both of them are HIV positive, and um, they find the uh, pieces um, healing for them. So, so this is uh, the last slide. So, I just have to say that um, I'm really grateful that. I was able that the, the the sculpture were able to connect with people, and um, that's what I'm trying to make art for. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Horatio. Um, thank you so much, Damon, and thank you so much, Aaron, as well too. Um, I'm just going to get us right into questions because there are a few of them. Um, so the first question is really moving from two dimensional art to three dimensional art. Um, one of the folks in the chat said, for those of us with experience in 2D uh, work or 2D public art, but not sculpture, what does it look like for you all to translate your two dimensional work into three dimensional work? Jump in. Is that an open question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, um, for me, I think I was up for a new challenge on where to take my creativity. Um, so going from 2D to 3D or public art installations was a little bit of a challenge, but I think once I knew what the parameters were and what the tools were and what the subject matters, I was able to apply some of the same things I did from 2D art over to 3D art. So it was really just the learning came in of learning the material, the limitations of perforated metal, um, 
laser cut metal, those kind of things, and just applying and developing new styles and new ways to tell those stories in unique ways. And I think where I was at in my career was I was up for a new challenge. So for me, I found it a breath of fresh air, but I'm not going to say it didn't come with with headaches and challenge and losing sleep and staying up late at night to try to figure things, you know, even with the project I showed, um, yeah, it's easy to put a lot of pieces together, but if I wanted a diamond float in the middle, it couldn't be there because it needed to attach to the rest of the metal. So it was like these creative problem solvings or puzzles. I just, I love it. <laughs> I can stay up all night doing it and lose sleep. So that's just me. Um, so that's my transition. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, I, I was just ready to get off the computer. So, um, you know, I do a lot of wheat paste murals, or I think a lot of my early portfolio for public art is based on murals because that is still flat, something that I was at least a little bit familiar with, you know, working in that dimension. And then just even the project that I showed, it has a little dimension, you know, like it's working with objects, it's hanging it up in the air. Um, and, um, and it was still something that was done with a very slim budget, but that had an impact. So I think, I think you can just start, you know, just thinking a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Um, and also figuring out which calls are right to apply to, you know, like the ones that the city of Seattle sets up for emerging artists, they're not going to expect you to have a full portfolio with, you know, sculptures in it. I, I don't think, I mean, that wasn't my experience. You know, I think you, you can sort of under try to understand what you're applying for and make sure that it's like, it's suited to where you are. Um, I have maybe one thing to add uh, as a printmaker, I always think in layers. So you can think about 2D uh, services, but uh, multiple layers. Uh, and I also think about using uh, wrapping something uh, using. Uh, so I think about your design as a service design that can wrap around an object or an animal or something that have symbol. Uh, that symbolize whatever um, the subject matter you are working for. Oh, can't hear you. My first public art piece in boot camp um, was a jumping gym box. I, I took two of them that were plywood boxes and molded them together in the vinyl wrapped. Um, so. To speak on what Horatio is saying, like uh, that was my first intro, and then from there I went on, and and and, and I want to go on to use rope and materials and glass. I'm I'm excited about the possibility. So, kind of just depends on where you're at. Uh, so. And something <laughs> I want to add is that if you those of you are, are good at uh, digital tools, or you know someone who could do it, find someone who can do a digital 3D design for you. And you can place a piece into a 3D space, and uh, used to be very, very expensive. And now a lot of people know how to do it. Uh, a program like SketchUp can help you place something in a 3D space really quickly. And I'm going to try and get. It's actually kind of nice because a lot of the questions are kind of under a couple umbrellas. So I'm going to try and get a couple more in. Um, we may go about 10 minutes over, so appreciate folks if uh, you're willing to stay. Um, but the second question is about budget, and there's a lot of questions about concept and budget. Um, so just a few of them. Um, for you as a new public artist, what did it look like to approach a public art budget when you hadn't done that before? Um, and then specifically, what did it look like to make sure that you were able to get paid at the end of the project as well? I can start. I mean, this is something that Damon and I talk about together, you know, because we want to do work together and we understand what our time is worth, which everyone in this room should know. I, and maybe it's because I come or Damon and I both come from design backgrounds. Like we're used to assigning an hourly rate to our time. And I, I honestly think that's a good practice, you know, to, 
um, think about how long something is going to take and then fill that in for the budget line for your labor. Um, so I'll, I'll stop it at that part and let the others. I, I'll go next. Um, I, again, I did come from a background of design and other project management skills. So budget was something um, I was not unfamiliar with, but in public art, I did realize you, you have this dream of what you want to do. Um, you know, I don't want to speak on Horatio's project, but some of the ideas he had, you know, real quickly when you put things in front of the team and you budget what it costs to fabricate things, it, your project and your ideas really begin to shrink or they have to more for change. So you kind of have to kind of move with, with the budget, but, uh, yeah, you definitely like I'm on another project right now and you definitely want to be mindful of your time. If you don't know what your time is worth, um, I would definitely figure that out before you go down this path to just make sure things are right. I don't know if Horatio, you have anything to add. You froze up a little bit. Well, yeah, what, well, what, it, just in case if Horatio does want to um, say anything, I'm wondering if maybe either like oh. Maya, oh, there you are, ish, maybe. All right, Horatio, I'm going to give you one second. You can like get your stuff together. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to really quickly maybe throw it to Maya or Jeremy too, if either one of y'all want to talk about from a project manager's perspective, um, what folks may want to keep an eye out for in terms of budget as they're building their concepts. Yeah, I'd say um, just really basically work with your project manager too. Um, like they're able to provide you kind of templates um, similar to the one Aaron showed that the Downtown Association provided to be able to consider the multiple things that go into a budget. Um, and we often advise artists to consider 20% as the artist fee. Um, and that doesn't include, that's like the, that's the concept. That's the kind of the original thinking. And then anything in addition to that, like time it takes to fabricate is that kind of time spent. Um, and so, but, you know, with your first public art project, we're, we're with your public art manager to really kind of hone in on the budget and know that it will kind of shift and change as kind of num more numbers come into view if the, and prices rise of certain materials as you go. And, but it is an important tool. I see your back, Horatio. And I, I, I thought you might be wanting to say something. So if you want to hop in, feel free. Oh, me. Okay. Uh, sorry, I think my internet was interrupted. Um, as a young, when, when I was starting out, I always want to try to do too many things with the budget. Uh, that was a big mistake because you're always disappointed when you come down to the wire and you realize you can't afford it. But I also um, encourage you to think about multiple uh, ideas. So, in, you know, start off, don't um, narrow it down to one idea too quickly uh, until you kind of uh, figure out the budget a little bit. Uh, so you give yourself more room to move and grow and, and then lead it to a different direction. But as a young uh, designer starting out, I always propose too much. And I often have like two proposal, three proposal, and don't do that. Great. All right. I think we have time for at least a couple more. Um, so we have a question about space and I guess maybe we can make this a little broader because I know space in Seattle is a little complicated, especially right now with how expensive it, expensive it is. Um, so as you're developing concepts for these artworks that are like extremely large and scale that may not fit in your like apartment, uh, how do you deal with the issue of space just as you're making things and what does that look like for you as you've developed your concepts and moved into fabrication? Um, I'm blessed to kind of have a larger studio now. Um, before I would do things like put it on my floor down the hallway, um, have to flip it, um, but normally I, I do have a space where I might take it somewhere and put it on the ground. Um, 
bring a lot of stuff into the computer um, and maybe take photographs of it and bring it to the computer and just learn how to uh, design it scale and just know it's larger. Uh, for larger ones I'm making, I do print them out on a whole, I, I print them out on the whole wall just so I can look at it and and take a look. But I would suggest maybe a computer, um, putting it down a hallway, uh, just whatever works for you. Um, I would recommend visit the space frequently. If you know your space and you have access to that space, go to that space, experience it. And then you can go back to your studio. You can build scale model. You can um, photograph it and then you can place it in uh, a photograph of the space itself. So if you have a sense of the scale, uh, you know, in real life and when you go back to your studio, you will producing that will fit that space better. Yeah, and I will just add, um, I've had to rent some spaces to finish up murals and different things. And then kind of back to my point about community building, you know, just, I, I know spaces in the community that I can use for a day or two at a time if I need to, you know, um, because I've shared projects with different groups and stuff. So it's good to have a lot of options kind of in your, in your toolkit for that. It's an important question. Awesome. And let's end on this. And before uh, we end, I'll just note that this session will be available on YouTube. I'll put the link in the chat. And additionally, you'll all be receiving a follow up email as well um, with links to our different programs and just links to our specific YouTube page. But let's just end on this one and then we'll close it out um, for folks like a lot of you all mentioned concepts that you had that were rejected or asked to shift what do you do with those concepts um do they just like go to die do you reuse them um and i guess how do you sort of deal with that rejection as you're building a new concept for a project um i i learned early in my career to deal with rejection um so i don't take rejection as something to really fold me and take me down. I just take it as a challenge to come back up with something different and reapproach it. Um, yeah, I like with my time, I do like them to hit, but um, I don't mind. And then one concepts that don't make it, just like any other ideas that I have in my mind, I store them, put them somewhere there in my head. There might be elements that I pull from a project that didn't make it over to another one, um, those kind of things. As a creative, I mean, I think I'll pull something from something I did in high school. Like I just have a mind full of ideas. So it's not a waste to me. It's gonna come out at some time. I second that. <laughs> uh, I always thought I would recycle my ideas, but, uh, but it never happened because you always think of something more interesting. Um, even, you know, when you read, Make it a different proposal, or when you get a different project, you have a totally different set of uh, idea. And I think, uh, like Damon said, that you know, as creative, we should trust ourselves that we are uh, the people who come up with ideas. We are the idea machine, and we shouldn't we shouldn't worry about uh, limitation of idea. That this is what we are for. We are creative people, and ideas going to come out. Uh, come out of you, we just have to relax. Well, huge thank you, Damon. Huge thank you, Aaron. Huge thank you, Horatio. Huge thank you to the audience because there were some technical difficulties, but we got through. And yeah, I placed some links in there uh, specifically to our YouTube and to our calls and opportunities. Um, again, please keep an eye out for future sessions uh, with engineers. We'll have an opportunity to talk about fabrication and then um, some of the legal professionals where we'll have an opportunity to talk about life after the project. But um, don't hesitate to reach out to either Jeremy or Meyer or myself. Um, I think if you have any other questions that weren't able to be answered, we'd love to, yeah, be able to figure out how to support. So um, huge thank you again and hope to see you soon.